Mario Rios is part of the fitness matrix. He's a six day a week push pull leg bra and he thinks that a lat pull down is an isolation exercise. He says that bodybuilding is bad and ruins your life then in the same breath says that he's a bodybuilder and he wants to build muscle. Chest up. Shoulders back. This is Revival Fitness. And we're gonna do some, I don't know if you wanna call this friendly fire. We're gonna go over recent internet sensation Mario Rios. <laughs> I have nothing against the guy. I actually commented on one of his recent videos whenever he triggered Schmucky the Clown. I awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom for that effort because anybody who can send Greg Doucette into a tangent, I would consider on my good side. And as you guys may have seen, he does have a tendency to trigger bodybuilders. They do tend to be pretty emotional people. You take into account the fact that a lot of bodybuilders and fitness influencers have self-esteem issues ranging back to their childhood. Then you mix in all of the hormones they take, their estrogens through the roof. It's not exactly surprising. I was originally going to react to Doucette versus Mario, but I realized it's probably a waste of time. If you're familiar with this channel, you are familiar with Greg Doucette's tactics. The way he manipulates and gaslights and construes words. And I saw that his buddy Johnny Shreve also made a video about Mario. That guy Johnny Shreve is more boring than watching baseball. I'm not going to even spend any time on him. But in one of his recent videos I came across Mario talking about his concept of aesthetic bodybuilding. By the way, he's not one of these guys that says aesthetic. He calls it ass-aesthetic. But this is basically what his core philosophy is once you can kind of get past all of the trolling and the clickbait. A lot of guys on the internet, man, they love to pretend like they're these stoic badass dudes, but they get so easily triggered and offended over the smallest things. A lot of you guys are total posers. So I do like Mario, but a few things in this video in terms of personal opinion I disagree with and then some other things he's just objectively wrong about. So... Let's set the record straight. If you've been watching my channel for a while now, you'll know that the athletic body is the best by far. And I'm not just saying this. This is based on actual data. Women don't like the bodybuilder body type. I think the lean slash athletic look on a man is way sexier than the bodybuilder type. Okay, well, I would agree with that. If you're talking broad stroke, most amount of women possible, they're going to favor the so-called swimmer's body or the lean MMA style body more so than a serious fitness model or bodybuilder. That said, though, there are definitely women, even so-called normie women who don't really take fitness extremely seriously. They still will take the bodybuilder guy. I've said before, the more muscular that you get, the more that you dwindle down the prospects. But if you're a guy yourself who's into kind of really fit buff gym girls, I don't think getting bigger is going to necessarily hurt you. Now, I know a lot of you guys have the typical aesthetic. You like girls that look like Barbie dolls with thin little legs and thigh gaps. And all that stuff, that's not really my preference. I prefer the thicker gym girls myself. So it's going to kind of vary based on your own preference. I will say, though, he said the best body type and then correlated that to what women prefer. That doesn't mean the best. That's very subjective. All guys lift weights to improve their lives. And as the old saying goes, the world is nicer to attractive people. So if you want to live a good life, it's important to look attractive. He's absolutely right about that, man. I love when guys come online and say stuff like, I don't lift for women. I don't make all this money for women. You know, like the whole Sigma male thing. Like these guys are going to be jacked and rich, but just exist in their mansion by themselves. A lot of guys on the internet are totally LARPing their faces off. And it's not to say that getting women is the only reason that you lift. But if you're going to act like that's not a very nice byproduct of lifting, you're only lying to yourself. Which is why I invented athletic bodybuilding, where you bodybuild to look like an athlete. Okay, so we've got a clear definition right from the horse's mouth. Athletic bodybuilding is bodybuilding to look like an athlete. So essentially what he's saying is your overall aesthetic is not going to be a mass monster or something like that. It's going to be, what would it be, the Leon Edwards physique where that whole meme came from? He basically thinks that you're going to go to the gym to achieve the so-called athlete's body. One thing I'll say right off the bat here, the athletic body is a very broad concept. I understand what he shows, right? He has his own reference points for this, but a lot of athletes look a lot of different ways. There are a lot of professional athletes that, by internet fitness standards, would be called D-Y-E-L. Mario doesn't say this himself, but I've roasted Athlean X in the past. He calls the so-called Athlean range, like 7% or so body fat up to 10. The vast majority of professional athletes, guys, are not under 10% body fat. There's plenty of pro athletes that are upwards of 20% body fat or more. So the notion that being shredded is somehow correlated to athletics is totally incorrect. 
you're going to see a lot of leaner MMA fighters and runners and things like that, soccer players, where cardio is inherent to the sport. But even then, the vast majority of pro athletes, even the ones in cardio-based endeavors, are not going to be shredded by internet fitness standards. So if you guys are new here, please do not conflate being shredded, fitness model ripped, with being athletic, because those are not the same thing. Being shredded is a detriment to your athletic performance. Let me warn you, there are side effects to athletic bodybuilding. One being you're gonna be way more athletic than all your friends. When I do kickboxing, I'm too big for the small guys and too fast for the big guys. You're gonna obtain the perfect mix of speed, strength, and power. Second, you're gonna get a lot of stares from women. In your normal gym, not that many people actually train to look aesthetic because what guys in the fitness community deem as athletic isn't what's truly aesthetic in real life. Because C-Bum is not aesthetic in real life. He would be considered excessive. Well, that is true. Chris Bumstead, by conventional standards, is excessive. But he said most guys don't train to be aesthetic. That is not true. The overwhelming majority of guys in gyms do not want to look like Chris Bumstead. That is, again, a very specific niche of the fitness industry. That guy's got, what, almost 20 million Instagram followers or something. He's the most well-known bodybuilder, active bodybuilder, on the planet right now. That said, though, the vast majority of guys, one, do not want to look like that. Number two, I hope they realize this, they probably do. They're never going to look like Chris Bumstead. That guy is top 1% bodybuilding genetics. All the PEDs needed to get to that point as well. It's no comparison. The average guy would rather look like an MMA fighter, a lean MMA fighter, than Chris Bumstead. This is why guys who are just blatantly full of crap like Kena Body still make so much money in this space. He sells what? The movie star physique. Athlean X, right? Think about even him as I just brought him up. He, in his own name, Athlean. He sells the same thing. The average guy consuming fitness content would rather look like Kena Body would rather look like Jeff Cavalier than Chris Bumstead. They may draw inspiration from him, but in terms of actually chasing the way he looks, I'd say that's much smaller than you may think. When you gear your training like an athlete, you're gonna get a lot more attention from women because there are biological and universal standards of attractiveness in a men's body, which is that athletic lean B taper, where you've got a muscular back, broad shoulders, and a narrow waist. Well, that's interesting. Muscular back, broad shoulders, and narrow waist sounds like bodybuilding. Does it not? So if you're a woman and you see two guys in the gym, one of them does so-called bodybuilding training, the other one does more athletic training, and they both have broad shoulders, a V-taper, they're relatively lean, the woman can't tell the difference. She can't be like, oh, well, that guy, he must do bodybuilding only training. That guy must do athletic training. You can't tell that right off the bat. Now, if you actually get them out onto a field and they compete against each other, then you could break that down. But from just the visual itself, you can't just look at somebody and know for sure they do one style of training. Unless you're talking about the massive IFBB pros. Once again, though, that is a fraction of a fraction of the population. They're really hard to use as a good example in all these cases. What is the definition of athletic bodybuilding? My definition of athletic bodybuilding is training like a bodybuilder to look like an athlete. This sounds suspiciously familiar to Athlean X's. If you want to look like an athlete, you got to train like an athlete. So in a literal standpoint, I am a bodybuilder because my main goal is building muscle. Oh my God. Okay. I got to go on the tangent, guys. I'm sorry. Just because you want to build muscle does not mean you're a bodybuilder. Okay, guys. How low is the bar in modern society? Okay, so by this metric, oh, I'm a bodybuilder because I want to build muscle. Do you understand that makes almost every single person in the gym, besides the cardio moms, that makes them a bodybuilder. Every guy going into the gym wants to build more muscle. I said this before and it really angers guys, but it's the truth no matter how much your ego wants to revolt at it. Bodybuilders compete in bodybuilding. Powerlifters compete in powerlifting. Athletes compete in organized sports. So guys will come on the internet and say like, oh brother, I'm a calisthenics athlete. When's your next calisthenics competition? Oh, I don't compete. You're not an athlete then, bro. I'm a bodybuilder. Okay, sure, bro. When's your next contest? I don't compete. When was your previous contest? I don't compete. Bro, you have to compete in formal organized events to call yourself a member of these activities. On a broader level too, man, even if you don't like bodybuilders and the culture and all that stuff, which I understand, it's pretty ridiculous to compare yourself and put yourself on the same level as them. The amount you have to pour out into competitive bodybuilding, whether it's an amateur level all the way up to the pros on the Olympia stage. The money investment, the cost to register for the federations, register for the shows, travel to the shows. Nobody's paying for their flights or hotels or anything like that either. The tanning, 
shaving all the time, the hours upon hours of posing practice, the extreme dieting, eating all the meals consistently all the time, never missing these meals, having a formal coach, paying for the coach, getting up on the stage, comparing yourself with other people on the stage, right? All of this goes into the formal, competitive, organized activity that is bodybuilding. But then you've got Joe Smith at the LA Fitness, oh, I'm also a bodybuilder. Sit down, bro. But the huge difference between athletic bodybuilding and bodybuilding is that in athletic bodybuilding, you build functional muscle. This is muscle that helps you in real life activity. Because when bodybuilders build muscle, it affects their mobility, stamina, and even their health. What's the point of lifting weights if you're not becoming healthier or more attractive? Okay, so he's basically going the functional training route. I have a video, guys, I made a while ago about the myth of so-called functional training. Functional strength or muscle, whatever you want to call it, functional exercises, functional training, all these buzzwords, that's nothing more than marketing. So his premise, from what I'm understanding here, is basically like, oh, well, if you build muscle on machines versus if you do it on free weights, your body's not going to be able to utilize the muscle as much because it's not functional. I understand that from a direct carryover perspective, especially for sports. That said, though, muscle is muscle. So say you have two guys, one uses a barbell back squat to build up his legs, the other guy uses a hack squat machine. Is there really going to be a massive difference in terms of what the muscles they build, in terms of what they can do once they're applied to other avenues? Let's say they both compete in MMA. Do you think the difference is going to be that massive? I don't think so. If you have the guy who does only machines and then he jumps into MMA from that point, then you can make an argument. But if these are both relatively athletic guys from the onset, if they're both active, especially if they do other exercises too where they're on their feet a lot, you do the weight training to complement the other activities you do. So you see these guys online like, oh, well, I do a cable golf swing to get better at golf. Or I get down on my knees and do a cable cross punch to get better at MMA. You build the muscle in the gym and then it translates better to the routine that you do for your chosen sport or activity. Bodybuilding principles will allow you to build more muscle, but I doubt it's that much. I started my weightlifting journey at 130 pounds, and now I'm at almost 180 pounds. Of course, when you see my physique compared to all these bodybuilders, I look small. When in fact, in real life, I'm actually bigger than the majority of people. I've mentioned this a lot on my channel, guys. The standards of looking like you lift and looking so-called big in the online fitness community, as he would call it, the fitness matrix, and the general populace, totally skewed. But unlike the bodybuilder body, the athletic body is actually powerful. But in order to build it, we need to be using certain bodybuilding principles. One being training splits and training focus. With an athlete, you only have a certain amount of time. Those are some wicked half squats, man. Time where you actually prioritize weightlifting because you're going to prioritize your actual sport. But with athletic bodybuilding, you still want to prioritize weightlifting as your main form of exercise. This girl in the back here has very good form on the good morning. Which is why I do bodybuilding splits. My favorite split by far is the push-pull leg split done six days per week oh my god dude even he's a push pull legs bra six not even five days a week with like a rest every fourth day six day a week ppl bro you're allegedly the athletic guy advocating for ppl dude the push pull legs thing it just is never gonna go away no matter how much i try to warn you guys about it man i talk to people on a daily basis on patreon on the discord etc hey man can you review my split I've been having trouble gaining strength. I'm plateauing a lot. I'm really tired. Let me guess, bro. What's your split? Every time, guys, like freaking clockwork, six day a week PPL, bro. The vast majority of people are not going to be able to handle six day a week push pull legs for any prolonged amount of time. A lot of guys are going to plateau on it relatively quickly because you're just in the gym so much. It becomes unfeasible for people with any semblance of a normal life. But the younger you are, the more you can get away with this type of thing, and especially the newer you are to the gym, I'd say you can do this more so because you're just not that strong yet. Your overall workouts are not that taxing. But the stronger you get, six day a week PPL, man, you're gonna end up burying yourself in the vast majority of cases. If you're going to do push-pull legs, guys, I would highly advocate you take a rest day after every third day, and you need to keep the volume per session very, very low. That's the only way you're going to be able to recover from this. You see some of these guys online, man. They go to the gym six, God forbid, seven days a week. I fight demons every day, bro. These guys are in the gym every single day. They do high intensity and they do high volume. I'll tell you guys this, bro. If you find somebody who is doing all three of those things at the same time, high volume, high intensity, and high frequency, and they're still growing easily, and they claim natural, 
they just outed themselves. Which is a split an athlete would almost never do. Exactly. And you're the athletic bodybuilding guy, but you like to do six day a week PPL. Come on, bro. And you want to hit each muscle group two to three times per week. This is how you maximize hypertrophy. If you're a beginner, you do want to hit every muscle just once per week so your body can adapt to the new training stress. But after two to three months of lifting, you should be hitting every muscle group two days per week minimum. There's no need for a beginner to only hit everything once a week. The most time-tested novice programs on the planet Earth are three day a week full body and you hit your muscles three times a week. Albeit low volume per session, but that's going to be needed regardless. But there's no need to have beginners do, oh, well, you're going to tight trade up. You're going to start with one time a week, then go into two or three. Just start off from the beginning with two or three. I'll almost never hit anything three days per week, except if it's a weak muscle or a weak spot of mine. We're also going to take rep range and proximity to failure like a bodybuilder. The research says that anywhere between five and 30... Take notes, guys, if you're new to the gym. When he unracks this weight, Watch what he does. His brother's got a grip on it, and then he thrusts it out. Notice how he doesn't stabilize his arms. He just gets it out and then drops it right down. You don't want to do that. Guys, whether you have a spotter or not when you're unracking a bench press, get it out, let your arms come to a total stop, totally stabilize them, then do your first rep. This type of assisted dive bombing thing here, this is how guys end up getting hurt. The research says that anywhere between 5 and 30 reps can elicit the same amount of muscle growth as long as you're training near failure. But if you look at any muscle building textbook or research, they'll always say 6 to 12 reps is the best for building muscle. This is because the time under tension in that range is time under tension, brah. King Tut, brah. Optimal for muscle growth. But a lot of people do think that time under tension is overrated, but it's still within that 5 to 30 rep range. Time under tension is absolutely overrated in two aspects. One, guys who think that the longer the set goes, the better it's going to automatically be for muscle growth. So you'll hear guys be like, oh man, you got to do 20 reps, bro. Get the pump, get that burnout. Most of the set you're doing with very high rep ranges, guys, you're not getting any mechanical tension or effective reps. Meaning if you're doing a set of 20, the first 10 to 12 reps of that set, they're not a challenge for your body. This is why you see a lot of guys now in the science community advocate six to eight reps or five to eight reps. I have a video in the top corner if you want more details on that. But if you're doing these lengthy sets, you're not going to be really stressing your muscles out sufficiently for most of that time. You're essentially just wasting time. And the other thing too, when it comes to time under tension, these guys who turn their reps into real time slow motion, they milk out the negative really slow. And some of them even milk out the positive really slow. There's no need to do that, guys. That is just a gimmick that looks cool online. Get a nice controlled negative press up with force on the positive, you're going to build as much muscle as you can. So I would say 6 to 12 reps is the best for building muscle. Okay, that's a little too broad in terms of a rep range you'd be using on like a set per set basis, I would say, but 6 to 12 for the most part, I can agree with that. A rule of thumb, if you're close to failure, you're maximizing muscle growth. At least three reps away from failure. Athletes typically don't train that close to failure because of the soreness. You also want to have rest time similar to a bodybuilder. There are so many different numbers for what rest time is best for each goal. So I combined my analysis of research and what I learned through my education to determine the best rest time for building muscle. I found that for isolation movements, one to two minutes is best. I would say if muscle building is your primary goal, you probably don't need to really go underneath two minutes. I mean, if you're in a rush or something like that, I get it. But the more rest time you take in between sets, even for the smaller stuff, that's going to allow you to extrapolate your strength across numerous sets better than if you rush through. Guys think that short rest time is best because it keeps the pump more enhanced. Like, oh, I finished a set of curls, bro. Wait 30 seconds, start curling again. You keep all of the blood flow into your muscles when that's the case but getting the momentary pump is not the goal of training. Isolation movements where you're targeting one specific muscle. Examples would be a lat pull down. A wait, wait, wait. Did this guy just say a lat pull down is an isolation exercise? Mario, you just showed your degree on the screen. How do you think a lat pull down is an isolation exercise? The lat pull down is the grounded version of a pull up. Is a pull-up an isolation exercise? Bicep curl or a chest fly? Yes, the bicep curl and the chest fly are, yeah. The lat pull-down, uh, no. For compound movements, you want to rest between two and three minutes. Depending on the compound movement, I would say around three. If it's very taxing for you, going up to even five minutes in some cases may be necessary. That's not really a bad thing, guys. Don't get down on yourself or try to rush through that. If you're very tired after a hard set of deadlifts or squats, for example... If it takes you five minutes to get a drink of water, you know, stop seeing stars, kind of get your senses back about you, that's totally fine. Also, too, pro tip, 
Don't let people in commercial gyms try to rush you away from equipment. I'm sure you've been here, right? You're resting like, oh my god, that was so hard. Some guy comes up, how many sets do you have left? And then you start to feel guilty because you're taking up his time and you rush through. Don't do that. Now movements are multi-joint exercises where you hit multiple muscle groups. Examples being a bench press, squat, or a deadlift. For rep ranges and rest time, you want to have a variety. Some of my subscribers will send me their workout plans and it's going to be squat for 15 reps, then lunges for 15 reps, then hip thrust for 15 reps. That's a fair point. I see a lot of programs, namely the ones you'll find on generic websites. I don't think you need to have this extreme variance per exercise, but I do think it's good to work in a variety of rep ranges just to get accustomed to those kind of see what your strength is in numerous rep ranges too. And even then, if you're plateaued on a given exercise, switching up the rep range, generally going up to a little bit higher reps than you're currently doing, can help you bust through that plateau as well. And just like a bodybuilder, you want to prioritize the most aesthetic muscle groups. And what do I mean by prioritize? I mean hit them first and for more volume than an athlete would. For example being the mid delt. The mid delt is one of the most important muscles for an aesthetic physique. But do athletes really need to be prioritizing their mid delt? No. The four most aesthetic muscle groups are your back, shoulders, abs, and legs. Back, shoulders, abs, and legs. I can totally understand that. I'm kind of surprised he mentioned legs. A lot of the aesthetic bras, they ignore their legs heavily. Eventually, they'll be guilted into training them. Once again, though, if we're talking the general populace of guys, their legs are always going to take a back seat in terms of what they prioritize or care about. A lot of guys will skip legs or largely skip legs for their entire training career, whether they admit it or not. But the conventional male aesthetic is not lower body dominant, so I'm interested to see what he says. Back and shoulders give you that width to get you that B taper. And abs, women like abs, let's be honest. If you look at any of these videos, the only girls that say they like a dad bod are either really politically correct, or let's be honest, they're not very good looking. There is definitely truth to that. A lot of women nowadays, I guess because women are so entrenched in the body positive culture, they're like, oh my god, I like a dad bod and all this other stuff. As a general rule, hot girls like to date hot guys. Even the less hot girls want to date the hot guys and vice versa. The less hot guys want to date the hot women too. Everybody's always trying to go up in the pecking order, so to speak. As a rule, guys, if you see one of these schlubby, out of shape dudes and he's got like this smoking hot bombshell woman with him, there's a very fair chance she's outright using him for his money or they have an arrangement where he directly is paying her to spend time with him. All you need is a flat stomach. If you go get groceries or walk to a store, you're gonna see most guys don't have a flat stomach. So just getting a flat stomach puts you apart from a lot of people. And your legs, because if you don't build your legs, you look stupid. Building big legs give me a lot of confidence because I can wear higher shorts, which kind of puts me apart from a lot of people. And the focus goes more toward my quads and not my calves. Looks like Mario is a fellow small calf haver. That's a pro tip for you guys too. If you want to hide your calves and shorts, you got to invest in some crew socks. Yank those MFs up. Not exactly as high as you can, but you can yank them up pretty high. Right to where for most guys, right here, right after your top of your calf starts to run out, pull the socks up right around there. You guys have probably seen these memes where it'll be like, this guy skips leg day, and some guys do, as I just talked about. But a lot of guys, man... If you have longer lower legs and you're not born with these just giant diamond calves, you find a dude with giant tree trunk legs. If he wears shorts that go down to his knee, and depending on the angle from which you see him, he will look like he skips legs. One thing too when it comes to girls, a lot of guys will say, oh, women don't care about legs, bro. Some of them don't. But if you're talking about a girl who likes an overall well-developed physique on a man, women absolutely like your legs and they also like your ass. And now, what do we take from an athlete style of training to build an athletic body? Well, you wanna prioritize athletic movements. When I say this, a lot of people get confused with what I mean. I define athletic movements as either multi-joint compound movements or exercises where you're on your feet. Those aren't exactly as similar as they may seem. So for example, anything done on your feet, you could do a lateral raise while standing. He just said you need to prioritize the side delt for aesthetics. Is that really athletic just because you're standing? And doing a lateral raise? I would say no. On the other side too, he goes at guys who use machines a lot. The hack squat, for example, is a multi-joint movement, but you are using a machine. Here are a couple examples of an athletic movement versus a bodybuilding movement to hit the same muscle so you guys don't get confused. An athletic movement for your legs would be a squat, while a bodybuilding movement would be a hack squat. Because the hack squat, you have no stability, it doesn't replicate anything in real life, and you're leaning against the seat. Squat is an athletic movement where you're stabilizing your own body and you're on your feet. So he's not totally wrong. You're going to involve more core, more low back, 
more hip, more ankle, more foot, all these other stabilizing things when you're doing a barbell squat. That said, though, he said that the hack squat doesn't replicate anything in real life. I find it very unlikely in a scenario which you're going to have to like, oh, I pick somebody up when I'm squatting up and down with them, right? I mean, the most applicable scenario would be you get somebody on your back and you carry them to a location. I don't think there's any conceivable scenario besides fitness TikToks where you're going to be picking somebody up or picking something up and just hoisting it up and down in a squat pattern. Athletic version of a bicep exercise would be a standing bicep curl, while a bodybuilding one would be a bicep curl machine or just sitting down and hitting your biceps. Like I just said, man, with the lateral raise, is a standing bicep curl really athletic just because you're standing? Like, do you think there's any serious level of core involvement curling a 50 pound easy bar in front of you? minuscule if anything i mean you're really reaching at that point if you want to talk about an athletic so-called bicep exercise it would be a chin-up i don't know if you could even classify any sort of isolation exercise in general as an athletic movement even then that does not mean that they're bad or that they're useless you want to do this as much as possible however to hit certain muscle groups sometimes you have to lay down or sit down an example being a bench press you can't hit your chest standing up you gotta lay down on a bench actually you can you could stand and do a cable crossover so would you be able to say based on this criteria that the standing cable crossover a lot of guys too in a cable crossover they kind of get in like a half runner's position like they kind of tilt their legs and lean forward to lean into it that's almost an athletic position right could you say that the cable crossover by these metrics is more of an athletic exercise than the bench press because you're on your feet compared to laying down? Another muscle group I do hit a lot like a bodybuilder is my back. Because to have variety to hit your lats, you need to be pulling from up to down, like in a lat pull down. Or, you ready for this one? You could do a pull up. Other than those two examples, I pretty much hit everything like an athlete. And that's literally it. You train like a bodybuilder, but with athletic movements. And you'll see your athleticism and your looks and aesthetics improve greatly. I just don't understand this dichotomy of like, oh, well, I do bodybuilding style training with the sets and the reps and the volume and stuff, but I do athletic movements. It's like, bro, do you know how many bodybuilders do back squats and deadlifts and overhead presses? You know what I mean? Like, it's not like these exercises belong just in one category. Like, it's a bodybuilder exercise or it's an athletic exercise. There's a lot of overlap between the two. Like I said, athletes should be spending a lot of their time on their feet. Even then, man, you can easily make the case that a lot of athletes, especially you see in the modern day, so many torn ACLs and knee injuries and stuff. I think you can easily argue that a lot of athletes would benefit from doing isolation style stuff for the hamstrings, like a hamstring curl machine. Same with the low back and the glutes for injury prevention there. Maybe a machine like the reverse hyperextension. So this dichotomy that it has to fit in one or the other camp, I think it's much more broad than that. There isn't just one way to do athletic bodybuilding. The way I train will be a little bit different than the way you train. Everybody has their own training philosophies. I'm a big fan of the deadlift for athleticism and hypertrophy, but maybe you're not. Maybe you prefer doing pull-ups or barbell rows. That's true, but he just used deadlifts in the same vein as pull-ups and barbell rows. Those are all different exercises. A deadlift is a heavy hip hinge involving a lot of the lower body. A pull-up is a vertical pull. A barbell row is a horizontal pull. You can't just like interchange all of those. Thank you guys for watching and I hope this video changed your life. It didn't. All right, so that's the video. I understand his philosophy and I get it. I program myself, guys. I tell you guys, especially who are beginners all the time, you need to focus on the free weight compound movements and master those to holistically use your entire body as a unit to improve your breathing and your bracing, work on all the stabilizers, etc. But I think this dichotomy of like, oh, well, this one is a bodybuilding movement. This one's an athletic movement just based on whether it's standing or seated or a machine or not. I think everything in the gym or most things in the gym ultimately have their place. It's really about how you apply them in the broader scope of your training. And also Mario, six day a week push pull legs brought unacceptable. But I like how Mario trolls the fitness industry. And I think he without question has good intentions when it comes to this. Hit me up, bro. We'll get a lift in at some point. But this has been it for me, guys. Thank you very much for watching. If you would like to check out my own training programs, get them in the link down below, revivalfitness.org slash programs. Get in direct contact with me on Patreon and join the community Discord server and save some money on great products and services. And I will catch you guys 
next time.